with Ian McQuarter. He's back and he's angry. Sean Connery praises Scotland and damns the press. <laughs> Hello and welcome to Campaign 99. Big Tam did his long-awaited turn for We Alex today. Sean Connery came to the aid of the party at a rally in Edinburgh. It was a curiously downbeat affair, dignified they called it, avoiding triumphalism and even overt top-thumping for the SNP. More a personal declaration of Scottishness and a thumbing of the nose at the Scottish press. This is Sean Connery asking you to vote for independence this time. Until now, Sean Connery's contribution to nationalism has been limited to voiceovers. But with the SNP languishing in the polls, though the latest today suggests a marginal improvement, the man they call the world's favourite Scotsman agreed to front his first SNP rally. Ladies and gentlemen, something I've wanted to do for a long time, I give you Sean Connery. The star insisted that he isn't a politician, and perhaps that's just as well, given his recent press treatment. So the media who turned up in strength were fascinated to learn exactly what he had to say. Well, he had a lot to say about them. I've never in my life witnessed or experienced such shameful abuse by this Scottish media. I'm ashamed of them, and I'm angry with them. Some of the hacks shifted uneasily at that, but 007 is no longer licensed to kill. Anyway, he said he'd come here to promote his new film. Then came the politics. My position on Scotland has never changed. In 30 odd years, Scotland should be nothing less than equal with all of the other nations of the world. The last time Sean Connery intervened in a Scottish election, it was to cement the united front with Labour in the 97 referendum campaign. Things went a little sour after that, when he was denied his knighthood by Labour. But using the royal we, he chose to remember the happy times. When we were up here for the referendum vote, there was a spirit and a positive enthusiasm. Well, the control freaks have blown it away. They have replaced it with fear and intimidation the very same way as others have before them. It was all commendably non-sectarian, very low-key, new politics. And though the invited audience of committed nationalists raised the roof, Connery didn't actually endorse the SNP by name. If I was asked, who do you think will win this election? My answer would be, hopefully, Scotland. And that was just about it. Five minutes and he was off. They've had such a battering from the polls in the past few days that I think they needed a fill-up. And who, who better to do it than their favourite son? Somebody has to re-energise their campaign and put it back on the, on the tracks. And he is the one person who's probably capable of doing that right now because of his charisma, because he's such a recognisable face, because he's identified with Scotland. You know, he can come in and, and get the, the whole thing started again. Well, maybe. It's not clear exactly what influence the Bond actor has on the Scottish electorate. Certainly, opposition parties think the SNP have made a mistake in seeming to pin their hopes on a film star tax exile. I think like all Scots, we take great pride in Sean Connery's international achievements and we don't take that away at all. But I think it's a bit much for a self-imposed tax exile on one of the 90 days in which he's allowed in the country to come and lecture the rest of us who live in Scotland, who work in Scotland, who have families in Scotland, that we should pay the extra taxation, which he desperately and successfully avoids paying. Sean Connery is a wonderful actor and we all love his films. Uh, his politics are a matter for himself, but frankly, if the SNP is depending on this performance today to lift the whole campaign, then they really are in a lot of trouble. We're delighted to have him here as part of the campaign uh, and I think some of the, the comments in the press and from opposition, uh, from our opposition uh, possibly are simply jealousy that he's an SNP supporter. 
The other parties have no plans to respond to the Connery visit by trundling out their own celebrities. They say they're going to stick to the prosaic business of politics and let showbiz be showbiz. Now from Dundee is the deputy leader of the SNP, John Swinney. And here in Glasgow with me is the Labour campaign team spokesman, Jack McConnell. John Swinney, first of all, aren't you uh, treating the Scottish electorate with contempt, relaunching your campaign on the back of our film star tax exile? Well, Sean Connery made an appearance in the election campaign on a day that we long knew he would uh, make his appearance. And we're delighted to have his endorsement, just as Donald Dewar and Jim Wallace and Gordon Brown were delighted to have his endorsement of the referendum campaign in September 1997. And what it shows is the long-standing lifetime commitment of Sean Connery to the work of Scotland and promoting Scotland has been restated in this important election but campaign. But does anybody we care? Positively welcome it. Well, I think people do care because Sean Connery is regarded very highly in every walk of life within Scotland, uh, regarded as an international ambassador for Scotland, and someone who I think speaks very warmly of the contribution that Scotland can make to the world, and we positively welcome his contribution. OK, Jack McConnell, you're just jealous. You don't have someone of his standing backing you. Well, I think uh, Sean Connery's a great actor. He's a great ambassador for Scotland, uh, but I don't think he's the issue in this election campaign. And I do think it was interesting today that on a day when Labour were talking about education and childcare, the SNP Sean and, Al Sean and Alex show was slagging off the Scottish media, and I think yeah, but you've brought on you've wheeled on football stars and businessmen, haven't you? I mean, yeah, well, I think exactly that's the case. But I think in, in each case we've done it on round an issue. We had football stars uh, publicising our commitment to Scottish football and a new programme of training in Scottish football two weeks ago, and we had a very strong press conference today on education and childcare. And I think it's the issues in this election that are uh, influencing voters, not the personalities, either political or celebrity personalities. Okay, let's look at the major issue this week, John Sweeney, because you're going to be publishing your, uh, your budget statement for independence. Uh, do you accept, there are many figures put on it, ranging from 10 billion, 7 <coughs> billion to 2 billion, but do you accept that, at least in the short term, there will be a Scottish budget deficit on independence? Well, I think the point that you've just made, Ian, is a very interesting one, that over the range of this campaign, Indeed, in the range of one television programme I did with Jack McConnell, he told me the Scottish budget deficit allegedly was £7 billion, £4 billion and £2 billion. So What figure what did you put earth, it at? What on earth Jack McConnell would know about it, I don't really know. Um, the issue that we've always concentrated on is the fact that Scotland pays its way, that we are the seventh richest nation in the world, we are a country that can well afford independence and well afford to prosper with independence because we're a rich country. Right, anyone, but you would concede anyone, that on independence anyone, 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 there would be a budget talk, deficit anyone, at least in the short anyone, term. Anyone that tries to talk Scotland down in the way that the Labour Party has done But would there be a budget deficit at least in the short term? It, no, there's no budget deficit because Scotland is a prosperous country, the seventh richest nation in the world. And even if you take a very hostile report to the concept of independence, which was published at the weekend, even okay. in its most hostile form, it conceded Scotland was the ninth richest nation in the world. So these arguments are a fallacy. OK, Jack McConnell, there would in fact be no budget deficit on independence. Well, I think we know that that's not true. Uh, when uh, well, uh, when I, I, I've, asked, I've asked John before in this election campaign, and we have repeatedly asked nationalist spokespeople to be clear about this. Well, he's been clear enough now. Well, he's I saying think, there is no well, budget Well, I think deficit. we welcome that statement and we look forward to seeing the figures when they're published uh, later this week. We'd also like to see in that statement a clear statement about whether or not there would be a separate Scottish currency, whether or not Scotland would meet the Maastricht criteria, what the level of borrowing would be, and how these negotiations... Yeah, but just on this budget deficit negotiations point, I mean, you're so well, sure there is a deficit. Yes. I mean, why are you sure about well, that? Well, because every reputable academic report uh, in recent months uh, has made it clear that there would be oh. some form of... <laughs> deficit on the on independence and I think if you take oh, any of the minute. if you take any of the figures into account either in terms of the current difference in spending between Scotland uh, and the rest of the United Kingdom or if you take into account the figures uh, on the costs of the breakup towards independence for a new social security system a new pension system a new army a new navy a new air force and new other arrangements for Scotland, then there is a deficit on independence. Right, John Swinney, John John Swinney you're, you're laughing at that. Untrue. Well, Jack, Jack McConnell is now toiling because he's quoting academic reports. And in the last few weeks, the David Hume Institute, Professor Andrew Hughes Hallett of, the, of Strathclyde University, and yesterday Grant Baird, uh, the former chief executive of Scottish Financial Enterprise, rubbished all of the arguments that Jack McConnell has just advanced. And in some of the most compelling arguments have been deployed against this position. And over the last, just over the weekend, Professor David Heald of the University of Aberdeen said that the debate had descended into a silly debate um, in which statistics were just been bandied around and there was a need for some clarity in this debate. That's not been offered by the type of language that Jack McConnell has just come out with. And what's clear 
it's been clear, as we've asserted over many years, that Scotland has generated, um, over the period 1979-1995, a huge budget, budget surplus while the UK was in deficit. We've proved that Scotland pays its way, and we'll go on to prove that point. Okay, well, well I think, uh, well, let, let me just come back on this, because I think John has made uh, a number of assertions there that are simply not true. One of the reports he mentions actually said that there was a current deficit, and I think that uh, it will be interesting to see when the SNP publish the proposals, which is all we've really been asking for now for three weeks, you said in your manifesto you would publish them, now they're going to be published, that's, that's welcome, and they can be scrutinised next weekend when do, they are available. Accept, uh, but there are costs, there, there, well, there are costs associated with the negotiations that John wants to begin on the okay. 7th of May towards independence. And right, they, you made, you made and that point earlier, let me ask you about about, let me ask you about the cost of devolution. Do you accept that under the so-called Barnet squeeze, Scottish public spending will be reduced relative to spending in England? Well, I think I th years? what we've always accepted is that the, the distribution of public expenditure across the United Kingdom is based on need. And there will be times when that benefits Scotland and there will be times when that benefits other parts of the United Kingdom. And that is right and proper. Uh, and I think it's part and parcel of being the same country. So you accept, that Scottish, that you say, well, accept that Scottish public spending will, will, re will be reduced no, I, relative I, to spending in England over the next three why, years? Why, why I accept, what Labour Party has always accepted, is that public spending across the United Kingdom is always spent on the basis of need, and that that need sometimes is greater in Scotland than elsewhere, and sometimes is greater elsewhere than it is yes, in Scotland. Increases but that in is public spending are not based not, on need, they're based on a formula no. called the Barnett yes, formula. Do yes, you accept those, that so under the operation of the Barnett those, formula there will be a reduction relative those, to but, spending in England? But that distribution need is based, is based on need, and it is right and proper that that need sometimes benefits Scotland and sometimes benefits other parts of the John United Kingdom. And I think that that's, well I think that highlights in fact the difference between the position of the Nationalists in this campaign okay. and the position of the Labour Party, because the Nationalists would break up that formula we try and create well, a separate Scotland. Right, well, let's, let's get John the Swinney's additional response costs to that. associated with those John public Swinney. expenditures well, uh, in Scotland you know, would have to be met by Scots. A number of a number of points are very clear about Labour's record on public spending. Um, as a result of the Barnet squeeze, public expenditure in the rest of the United Kingdom will increase two and a half times higher than it will in Scotland in the duration of the Comprehensive Spending Review. Labour has spent 1.1 billion less than in their first three years in office than the Tories spent in their last three years in office. That's why we've concentrated on the Penny for Scotland campaign, an initiative that will put £690 million into education, health and housing services in Scotland rather than taking a tax bribe in, from the Chancellor. And it's most basic, Very that, well, most basic that is enumerate because we've only been in power for two years, not three years, so those figures cannot okay. possibly be accurate. I'm sorry, we'll and, have and to continue this debate another time. Can, John Swinney, Jack McConnell, thank you very much. Biggest ever increase. Now, of course, Sean Connery is one of the SNP's biggest financial backers. And there was a row last year when Labour proposed to the Neil Committee inquiry into party funding that there should be a ban on foreign donations. The SNP complained that the Labour Party in Scotland had plenty of support from over the border in England. In the end, the parties agreed to a voluntary limit on political spending of one and a half million for the Scottish election campaign. Has it worked? And could it be a model for future elections in the UK? Here's David Porter. It's been an election of two halves, the haves and the have-nots. At one end of Wishaw last week, Liberal Democrat Scottish Parliamentary candidate Donald Gorry outside a school for a photo op. Nobody came, so his researcher took the snaps. Can't talk to him. A mile down the road, half an hour later, another school. Inside, Labour leader Donald Dewar comes to town in his battle bus, complete with retinue. There's tens of them. The local press turns out in force. This campaign does not come cheap. Labour, like other parties, could, in theory, spend up to one and a half million pounds trying to get the message across. But this is the first transparent election, fought under the Neil Committee rules. All large donations have to be declared, wherever they come from. I changed from being a full-time councillor to being an MP, so my earnings uh, quadrupled and my expenses stayed broadly the same. And I'm at the stage of life that my family has grown up, our house is bought, so um, uh, I had some spare money uh, and I've been uh, knocking my pan out for the cause for 30 years and to try and help it uh, at a critical moment uh, seemed to be a good idea. Right from the start, all the parties agreed to set up the Scottish Election Commission to act as holder of the ring. Each week, the parties make their returns on donations to the Commission. That's published, listing givers big and not so big. John and Anne Patrick gave up a holiday in Barbados for the cause. Normally, they have a winter break in the Caribbean. Instead, this year, they've donated that money to the Scottish National Party. I felt that in actual fact the SNP were really going places. 
and I was going to do my little bit to help them to go places to get complete independence. Uh, that's the reason for it, and I felt that the people who are representing the SNP are the, the type of people I admire and respect. It's all a bit like political limbo dancing. The bar just keeps going down and down. It started at £5,000 and over, then it went down to £1,000. Now it's all donations, even those in kind. As always, it seems it's the Conservatives who get most of the cash. It's very important to keep the democracy going and to have a, a good, strong opposition, either in the power or not in the power. And we must have democracy, we must keep the political party alive and going. And even the minor parties have their own sugar daddies. Pat Agnew is the John Paul Getty of the Scottish Greens. He's so far their only major donor. We had got to the stage where we'd had to give up having an office because we couldn't afford it. And as I say, every postage stamp has to be considered. And of course, standing in a letter to stand a chump, you need to have an office with an address and a telephone number and put out press releases and print pamphlets and all these kind of things. And then the ex expense needn't be enormous. It, it, it's more, more than the sort of money that the Green Party have. His biggest concern was reporting lines. And right. new Labour, old and new paymasters. Right. Willie Hockey runs a £100 million a year company, but he started life in the Gorbals and has now returned to his Labour roots. My upbringing, obviously, in the south side of Glasgow, was sort of socialist upbringing, but I've never been a member of the party. But I've been very, very happy with what I've seen with New Labour. And uh, Tony Blair's policies, to me, it seems that, uh, you know, in, in the past, um, the personas that the Tories would govern for the rich and the Labour would govern for the poor. And I really believe that the new Labour seem to be gov governing for all. So, transparent or not, what's clear is that what goes in comes out. Those with the large war chests are on the bus. Those with the small ones are left to fight on foot. Thank you very much. David Porter mixing money in politics and I'm joined now from Edinburgh by Dr Joan Stringer, Principal of Queen Margaret College and a member of the Scottish Election Commission which is overseeing spending by the parties in the election. Um, Joan Stringer, has, has it worked, this system? Uh well, yes, it's uh, very early days, of course, you must realise that. Um, but I think we're very pleased with the progress that's being made so far. The political parties are uh, sending in weekly statements of, their con of the contributions that they've received. Honest ones? And uh, as far as we can judge, they are. Um, and every week we are publishing those, we're, we're distributing them to the media, including yourselves. And um, I think we're, we're seeing some of the openness and transparency being injected into politics in Scotland that you were referring to earlier in your report. Are there other ways in which it could, the system could be improved? I think that one would have to say perhaps we should wait until after this particular uh, election to evaluate the effectiveness of it. Um, clearly, the Commission itself is a voluntary body uh, set up in response to the political parties themselves wishing to subscribe to the uh, Neil recommendations. And I think that's a considerable step forward uh, in any democracy. Uh, as Tony King, the chair of the um, Election Commission himself pointed out, uh, we are unaware of anywhere else, any other political system, in fact, where political parties have voluntarily uh, subscribed to have they this been, particular Have regime. they been absolutely straight? I mean, there have been questions raised, for example, at uh, some hidden expenditure, hidden political spending. There have been a number of people, for example, working for Labour in Delta House who um, have come up from the South. Do, uh, do they figure, are they included in the figures for spending that you have? Well, they are. Um, expenditure by uh, parties uh, or parties outside of Scotland, where there is a Scottish uh, par uh, part of that party, uh, will come within uh, the expenditure and donation limits. So do you think this could be a model for future United Kingdom elections? 
Well, I do indeed. I think um, that there's, great de there's going to be a great deal of interest, uh, particularly in Westminster, if not indeed uh, beyond Westminster, uh, in what happens. I think there are considerable issues here of uh, public confidence. And there's, as you're well aware, been a great deal of um, scepticism, if not cynicism, about the extent to which donations to political parties um, obscure the extent to which perhaps the, those donations may have been influencing those. Doctor, Certainly there's been a belief that that's the case. Dr. John Slinger. This will now clarify a lot Good. of Thank that. you very much indeed. Thank you. Now, the other celebrity to endorse the SNP in this campaign has been the model, Kirsty Hume. <laughs> So, is the politician's dress for success or not? Ken McDonald has been off to bitch about what they're wearing on the campaign catwalk. Yes, let's talk about fashion. For a start, it's a lot more interesting than talking about the campaign. And when the hustings begin, politicians of all stripes and not a few polka dots like to cut a dashing figure. This is as true now as it was in the 70s, the decade that style forgot. Well, style may have forgotten it, but we haven't. So first on the catwalk, the rising young star who was Donald Dewar. Can there be a more depressing job than being Mr. Dewar's tailor? Nowadays, we suspect being campaign manager of the SMP must run it quite close. But Donny was not alone in the elegant stakes. Malcolm Rifkind liked to campaign in a particularly fetching set of sideburns. That was before he privatised them and sold them to the lead singer of Slade. And you do get the impression that Brian Wilson has never been quite the same since Deep Purple split up. Give that man a scoop neck t-shirt. But for every fashion victim, there is a supermodel. Nowadays, the SNP have Kirsty Hume. Then Labour had Helen Little. Here she is belting out her impromptu version of Chirpy Chirpy Cheap Cheap. Mrs Little did make a brief comeback a few months ago, but is nowhere to be seen in this campaign. Labour hotly deny that's because she's been sidelined. She is, in fact, performing a key campaigning role. Door-to-door -door canvassing on St Kilda. Once it was just the Tories, now everyone has to campaign in a suit. New Labour were the first to jump on the bandwagon. Good heavens, you're not wearing an Armani to conference, are you? Well, I don't know why I came here tonight. Now even the Scottish Socialists have been down to Ralph Slater's. Well, Oxfam probably. They claim to be imitating Reservoir Dogs, but we suspect after the votes are counted, they may feel a lot more like the Blues Brothers. Once the SNP were the epitome of high fashion, that is, if you considered high fashion to be best exemplified by a souvenir shop in Rothsay. But the new modern SNP have developed something of a fear of tartan, so it's good to see Nicola Sturgeon donning the garb most favoured by politicians. When the going gets tough, wrap yourself in the flag. These saltars may be the very ones used by Donald Dewar during the referendum campaign, but nowadays he wouldn't be seen dead in that old thing. <laughs> and closely following the virtual bus, we have your actual Tackney, Paxi. Our Hackney Carriage focus groups have been giving pretty unflattering assessments of the Scottish election campaign so far. What election just about sums it up, but at least they know who Sean Connery is. Sean wants us to go to SNP, but Sean's not prepared to live here. If Sean committed himself to Scotland, I think you'd take him more seriously. I'd be more than happy to have Sean on board. <laughs> Sean can warm my bed anytime. <laughs> I'll take some of it. Oh, see, I looks a bit like Sean. I'll tell you, I need money. It'll be alright. I think, I think, I think you'll, I think you will get a few votes for the SP. You know, pull a few votes their way. I think, aye. definitely. No, I don't mean us in a bad way, but you find them attractive. <laughs> that's all, no, that's all, no. <laughs> that's all, no. You've got to remember, Sean Connery saved the world six times when he was James Bond. <laughs> you don't think he'll do it this time? Nah, definitely no. not. Not Scotland. Well, when you see him on the TV, you always think 007, you only think SNP, you know? I'm a big fan of Sean Connery, but he seems to come over and, and say his piece and uh, 
and then bugger off again basically. View from the streets. Now for a quick look at tomorrow morning's political stories and no surprises. The record warns Sean Connery to stay out of politics. The Courier says Labour are dismissing the Connery factor. The Herald focuses on 007's attack on the media. I'm joined now by our political correspondent Kenny McIntyre and by Angus MacLeod of the Scottish Daily Express. Angus, it's, it's clear that um, Sean Connery is very angry about his treatment by the press and by the press's treatment of the Scottish National Party. Do you accept any of the responsibility for that yourself? Well, I don't accept any responsibility, and of course, but I have to say too that I think um, he does protest too much. I mean, uh, certainly he's at a rough time. I wouldn't possibly disagree with him on that. However, in the context of other elections, and in the context of other, dare I use the word, monstrance of uh, political figures, of people associated with political parties, it's actually been, it's not been all that bad. It's uh, been pretty bad. Uh, well, has it? I mean, compare it to uh, what happened to Neil Kinnock before the 92 election from some of the London papers. Compare it to... But that was pretty bad. Well, that was pretty bad, but compared <laughs> to what happened to Connery, I mean, it was it was pretty bad. But uh, I don't think that Connery got a, a terrible time from... I think he... I think I'm amazed that he's amazed that certain sections of the press in Scotland uh, as verbally assaulted someone who was threatening the hegemony of the Labour Party, given their natural loyalties. Kenny McIntyre, do you think uh, Sean Connery is a bit thin-skinned. I think he is actually. I think he's going over the top. I think that you know politicians and actors, in a, in a sense, today is in a dual role. And they, they, they're happy to use the media when the, the going's good. I, mean, I don't think it's been. Some of the things been said about him have been perhaps been slightly unfair. He hasn't had a proper chance to hit back. He certainly do it today. And I actually think he didn't do himself any great favours. But do you think the Scottish today. press has done itself any great favours, particularly the tabloid press, in the in the conduct of this campaign? Well, I think with regard to some of the issues, such as uh, as Connery specifically and two or three other things and people look trying to look into the private lives of politicians in Scotland there's now a lot of digging going on I think there they haven't but I think in terms of the, the broad media they have been asking the SNP for a range of answers to some specific questions we've been asking other parties as well and I think journalists well, have a right well, to, Angus to get Well, are questions. they asking those questions as harshly of Labour as they are of the SNP? Well, I slightly disagree with Kenny to some extent. I mean, I, I think that last week, particularly during the STUC conference, where there was obviously, you know, an amazing amount of st uh, stitching up going on uh, and backroom deals and it was almost, you know, straight out of the, these uh, great old days of the 70s and 80s, you know, smoke-filled rooms and all that. I think perhaps Labour got off with uh, more than they should have been allowed to get off with in terms of their influence on that conference. But really, I mean, there have been other issues that could have damaged Labour, like, for example, PFI didn't really damage Labour. But then again, that was not particularly the press's fault. Yeah, okay. Labour was saying there was no stitch-up. We all knew there had been a stitch-up in question of the STC and the PFI and changing the, the, the motion to We all knew it. And we told the Labour Party, you know, you're not going to get away with it. And I think that it has been pretty even okay. There's been some pretty awful press conferences. I can tell you, with members of the, the Cabinet and the, mm. the press corps in Scotland this time as well. OK, um, Angus, John Swift. Winnie, the deputy leader of the SNP, said in this programme tonight, there is no budget deficit. He was very clear and emphatic about that. Yeah, and, uh, you know, I'm sure that before the end of this campaign, we'll get an, at least another two or three academic reports saying that there is a budget deficit ranging from two million to possibly 10 million and over. But what I was quite interested yesterday, and after the, the latest claims of a budget deficit came out, that the Labour Party didn't actually run with it all that much. I think maybe... But it, either, the, mm. the Kenny, they're coming up with the, the budget statement later this week. I mean, that is a clear statement from the SNP that there is no budget deficit. Well, that's what Mr Swinney said. It's even the reason that Labour didn't run with it much yesterday, because the, the small print in a sense at the end of the report mm -hmm. said, well, look, mm -hmm. in two or three years' time, independence is on a much better hue, and the, the, the big fiscal deficit initially actually gives away to much better times lying ahead. That's why Labour didn't run with it yesterday. But, but the, yeah, the point that, you know, Mr Swinney may well say that, but he is also missing the point that throughout this campaign, the question has kept coming up and has created an awful lot of damage for the SNP. Angus McLeod, Kenny McIntyre, thank you very much. That's just about all from Campaign 99 for now. We'll be back on Friday night at 10.45 here on BBC One Scotland. And you can see more of the Holyrood election campaign on cross-examination tomorrow night when the SNP leader Alex Salmond faces a grilling from his political opponents. That's cross-examination, 10.55, BBC One Scotland tomorrow. But for me, for now, goodbye. <laughs>